This is really child size, but this is the best I could get at short notice. Joyful and eager, my students are awaiting our date with destiny. They will not fail, for I shall not fail. We left off with Theodore Zoyskeisel contributing to the U.S. military as commander of the animation division that created Private Snafu. He had already published five books in a four-part joke book before the war, but with his wartime experience, he got to work in a film studio environment for the first time. As it turned out, that would create a whole complicated relationship between him and Hollywood for the rest of his life and beyond. In part two of this series, we'll look at the one film that stopped any trust he had in Hollywood filmmaking, and how animation saved his legacy. Admittedly, the last video had to deal with a lot of events skipped or glossed over. In the case of this one, I'm pulling a lot from the comprehensive book Dr. Seuss and Mr. Geisel by Judith Morgan. In the years after the war, Ted got a couple incredibly easy Oscars for adaptations of his live-action army films, which he made after Private Snafu. Neither of them survived government intervention, though. In between them, Ted entered a contract with Warner Brothers, where he immediately clashed on screen adapting the book Rebel Without a Cause. After all that ended, he resumed his writing with a plum. But let's talk about adaptations. The first adaptation actually came during the war, but before he enlisted, with Bob Clampett's Horton Hatches the Egg. Schlesinger Productions was the studio eventually contracted for Private Snafu, but prior to that, it was a matter of Clampett being introduced to the successful book and convincing Leon Schlesinger to buy the film rights. The short itself is steeped in Bob Clampett's style, so you'd be forgiven for thinking it's an original Looney Tunes short if not for the rhyme scheme and the elephant named Horton. Daddy, I won't. Despite that, it was well received and introduced Ted to a lot of future colleagues. Then, during his time as an officer, he signed off on two adaptations as part of Puppet Tunes, animated by Hungarian immigrant George Pal for Paramount. Despite both being nominated for Oscars and being pretty good historical works of art, they also became exceedingly rare. After all that, he got word from one of his Snafu co-writers, P.D. Eastman, who had joined UPA and wanted to probe him for a story. The result was Gerald McBoing Boing. Much like the Horton short, the adaptation was taken on in the studio's own style. The debut short won an Oscar, which led to a few more shorts and a small-time TV series for UPA. Amazingly, all these early adaptations give the impression that Dr. Seuss stories can do just fine in a different art style while still retaining his fanciful, sympathetic, and often quite dark sensibilities. While his books remained a work in progress during this time, he had a near spotless record on the screen and plenty of clout. And he spent that clout on a treatment for a film. Columbia, who released Gerald McBoing Boing, took on an original story about a boy forced to train on a piano and dreaming about it going to the extreme. This would have been Ted's big entry into Hollywood, and he put all he could into it. The styles range from faithfully Seussian to German expressionistic to weirdly golden age glamorous to just plain abstract. And then of course there's the handsome white guy primed to stay by young Bart's widowed mom. I'm in terrible trouble. So everyone gets into trouble. Everyone in the world, the king of Persia sometimes even gets into trouble. But the king of Persia, does he come crawling out of my air vent? Not at all. The king of Persia, he stays in Persia. The lack of tension through knowing it's a dream is more than made up for by threatening music, ominous landscapes, and just the sheer energy put in by Hans Conried, who was clearly enjoying his time playing basically the same character in Peter Pan and a Dr. Seuss movie at the same time. A capital suggestion, Strugo. One of our finest. The problem was that over time, compromises had to be made. The supporting cast are all just people in cheap costumes and body paint, even when they're clearly meant to have Seussian biology. In fact, why not name your favorite Seussian man-creature? I'm kind of partial to this elk man casually taking chokes, but my favorite has to be this sentinel who's clearly about to have his batteries handled by that hat hand in a gross and uncomfortable... Oh, never mind. And surprisingly, a big deal was made over how only about 150 kids were hired for the finale, although they could have used camera tricks to make it feel like 500. 
Most tragic would have to be that Ted put everything on the line, all of his best themes into what he called a vicious satire, and distracting himself from his obligations to Random House and to his weary wife Helen, who started suffering from ulcers and just wanted a vacation. In a way, it was too late and too early, coming out when Hollywood Spectacle was just past its peak, and low-budget grindhouse films were just starting to find their audience, and found itself awkwardly straddling between the two when it was promoted as a big Hollywood musical. Of course, the Dr. Seuss name was severely underpromoted in favor of producer Stanley Kramer, whose reputation tanked when this movie premiered. And it seems more than a few people agreed. A preview version that was reportedly upwards of two and a half hours with 20 musical numbers was a total disaster. It was then cut down by Columbia to an hour and a half with only 11 musical numbers plus reshoots. One of the musical numbers I have to be careful about describing because it can unduly boost your expectations, but the number in the elevator was originally longer, describing the other floors with extra torture noodle implements. Recreations are available on YouTube and they're worth seeking out. In one story, after Columbia's cuts, they destroyed everything and banned the full elevator song. In the end, after the movie flopped and Columbia tried to re-release it under the name Crazy Music, Ted was made embarrassed, dissuaded, and bitter about the Hollywood system. In fact, the only thing that kept his spirits up was finally being put on a vacation to Japan, of all places. He went back to La Jolla to keep writing books. His relationship with Phil Eastman continued with the launch of Beginner Books in 1957, but Philip Nell points out that Ted frequently complained about his role as editor for the line, often clashing with Eastman on books they explicitly collaborated on. In a memo regarding the Cat in the Hat Dictionary from 1964, quote, In the course of doing it, my love of writing for children was sort of trampled to death. During the 60s, a few things started to change. In the wake of television taking over the animation business, Warner Brothers officially closed their animation department, and while DePatty Freeling emerged as a direct successor, Chuck Jones moved to MGM, working on a Last Gasp Tom and Jerry revival. He then paid Ted a visit to insist on adapting one of his books for television. He realized that since the special would be done by Christmas, they only had one choice. See, the Rudolph and Charlie Brown Christmas specials created a demand from television networks for new specials every year. These were sponsored events that could be rebroadcast in future years with the plugs removed. With a bit of hounding, Chuck convinced Ted to join him to create a most faithful adaptation of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. There are a few details I'd like to point out just for amusement. You might know about Boris Karloff, but not what he looked like in his final years. The government of France. I've seen the uniforms of many governments in my time. And they really were his last years. Emphysema left him with half of one lung functioning, and he was hospitalized in 1968 for bronchitis where he spent his final year alive. It's a miracle he was able to articulate so well, although I don't know how to feel about the drum kit having a cleaner sound than the voiceovers. And took the last can of who hash You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. The special was sponsored by the Foundation for Commercial Banks, a fresh lobbying group that later merged into the American Bankers Association and consisted of a marketing campaign to certify so-called full-service banks, i.e. major ones, over smaller firms. They were a last resort bidder, and so obviously off-message that Chuck later remarked, You gotta be kidding, the bankers bought a story in which the Grinch says maybe Christmas doesn't come from a store? Well, bless those bankers' hearts, and I didn't even offer collateral. It wouldn't matter, since as before, the plugs would be removed in future broadcasts, with the sponsorship having done its job for that year. And needless to say, the special was well-received. Jones also produced specials for Horton Hears a Who, The Cat in the Hat, and The Lorax, but production of the latter two moved to the Patty Freeling after MGM closed down their animation studio. Incidentally, one of the last projects Jones did for them was an adaptation of The Phantom Tollbooth, which sort of addressed some of the aesthetic problems of Dr. T by setting the fantasy world with animation. It was still a financial flop, but a better reviewed one. Have you found my way yet? I hope it isn't mildewed. Speaking of Dr. T, starting with Dr. Seuss on the Loose, which you might have seen on home video as Green Eggs and Ham and other stories, Hans Conried was brought back to voice the Zacks, followed by the Grinch in Halloween is Grinch Night, a personal favorite. 
There's just something about when Dr. Seuss goes unrepentantly dark, especially with the voice of Captain Hook on hand. <laughs> Am I the Grinch? One last detail to bring up is that Ted managed to wrangle copyright over the more recent TV specials, sharing them with his second wife, Audrey. After all, they did follow his creative visions more closely. Up tick, up tick, ring around the rosy, how I hate working for this royal slob. At the very end, as Ted lived out his final years, he did give one last minute concession to Hollywood. Producers Roland Joffe and Ben Myron convinced him to work on a mostly animated feature film based on his final book, Oh, the Places You'll Go. It would have been a crossover spectacular written by him, made as a musical celebration of his legacy, and funded by TriStar. Unfortunately, he passed away during the writing process, and Joffe and Myron were soon tied up in the mess that was the Super Mario Brothers movie. <laughs> Since his cremation, Audrey took over his estate and lifted a lot of the restrictions he had in life, but kept it all reasonably in line. After a long bidding process, Universal and Brian Grazer took up How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and they made a big deal of staying faithful to the Seussian style for the first live-action adaptation. But Good Graces would only go so far. Honey, it was ruined when she bought it. And the cycle would soon repeat itself. You boob! <laughs> I'm just joking! <laughs> so that was the tragedy. Dr. Seuss, whose stories were destined for the cinema, remain largely doomed to fall short. Some adaptations find glorious success, but the legacy of this man is in how narrow a path there is from story to screen, and how specific things need to fall into place for something as effective as a Dr. Seuss story. But of course, Dr. Seuss is but one author. What about where he sits in the pantheon of children's literature? Well, that's one final legacy that we'll talk about next time. <laughs>